so last class we talked about a lot of different kind of things about his mostly history of earth and then sun and earth and the different electromagnetic radiation that sun and earth emits so this is kind of bottom line so uh, our best scientific knowledge dictates that saying that the earth age is about 4.6 billion years years which is 90 1 billion years is 1 billion is 90 which is pretty long history and then from the beginning uh, the air composition is quite different than what we have right now which is mostly oxygen and nitrogen so uh, in the beginning uh, the air composition could not support life form in the earth so somehow life and then uh, inorganic atmosphere kind of interacting together, they kind of build up the oxygen uh, in the atmosphere. And then uh, this oxygen is very important vital uh, source for the ozone layer in the stratosphere that protects us from the uh, uh, UV from the sun. So if you take a look at this uh, history of air composition past uh, 4.6 billion uh, years of Earth's history. So x-axis here is the uh, uh, years, and then y-axis here is air composition in 100%, right? So it is very recent thing that we have air composition as it is right now. So oxygen 20%, nitrogen is about 80%, which is about a uh, half billion years uh, history. So if you, it's quite a long time, but if you compare with the grand schematic of the Earth's history, it's pretty recent uh, history. So, um, the, so this has been an introduction, and uh, we will learn about the, during this whole quarter how quickly human actually messed up this air composition. Only uh, 300 years of history. So that's the uh, main theme of this class. So that's the uh, punchline that you should remember. Um, from the older things that we discussed the uh, um, last class. So today, we will talk about three basic physical parameters that defines uh, uh, air, which is temperature, pressure, and volume. And then we will have a little fun experiment with the uh, liquid nitrogen and couple of balloons uh, in the beginning of the uh, class. And then uh, we will talk about vertical distribution of the pressure and temperature. So as you know, the atmosphere is pretty, the, uh, it is uh, extended to the about 100 kilometer. So we'll talk about how pressure changes and then temperature changes uh, as a function of altitude. And then uh, we will talk about well-mixed gases and trace gases, what's the meaning of those two terms. And then we will talk about CO2 methane which is two important greenhouse gases. This is gonna be a basic introduction. And then finally, we will talk about air pollutants um, that is designated by EPA. There are six air pollutants uh, designated by EPA. And then EPA made a bunch of rules to control atmospheric concentration of the that, uh, six air pollutants. So we will talk about that six air pollutants. And then we will basically talk about the six air pollutants for the whole quarter, uh, this quarter. And then uh, we will kind of uh, think about, discuss about uh, kind of technological advances and then how those kind of advances affect on the environmental problem uh, at the end of the class. So let's talk about the pressure. So because we cannot see the uh, air, so it is difficult to uh, say that there's something uh, in the atmosphere. But now we know there's a bunch of air molecules is flying along the, uh, in the air. So first time people realized the uh, uh, existence of air molecule was about 1643. Uh, this is very famous exam, uh, experiment by the Torricelli, an Italian scientist. So what he did was he filled with mercury, which is, we call it HG. And then he has glass tube there. Not just glass tube, somehow he made completely empty 
inside of this class tube. So in this void, there was no L molecule inside of this uh, class tube. So if there's L molecule, which is really material that has weight, then the air is gonna be gonna be pushing this thing here. This uh, mercury, right? Mercury is basically metal, but it's a liquid, right? <coughs> so because this is empty here, then if there's a, a, the pressure is uh, uh, exerting this liquid surface, then this liquid uh, inside of this tube is going to be raised, right, in some level, let's say this level. Then total mass of this air should be at the same as the mass inside of the tube, right? Pretty basic concept, but a few thousand of human history, nobody actually tried this thing. And then somehow, he came up with this idea, Torricelli. Sounds like pasta sauce, but he happens to be an Italian. Anyway, um, so he just came up out of the, uh, this idea, and then he just executed this thing. And then the height of this thing was 76 centimeters or 760 millimeter. So this is how, um, so this uh, experiment was conducted on the sea level. So on the sea level, uh, the pressure, we call it 760 torr as sea level pressure. And then also sometimes we notate this thing, 760 mill millimeter mercury, like this. All right. So he happened to use mercury as a material for this experiment. What if he used water for this experiment? So mercury is much heavier than water. So you can uh, probably predict that the column of this water should be much higher than uh, 760 millimeter or 76 centimeter. So the dif uh, difference of the density of the water and mercury is uh, quite large. So uh, because of the density differences, basically weight differences, the, uh, the column height, if we, if we use the water for this experiment, it's going to be about 10 meter, right? So basically 10 meter of the column is going to be equivalent of the one um, atmospheric pressure um, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, air pressure. So if you uh, sometimes probably you are shopping around the, uh, your uh, watch, and then if we are a, if we are a diver, you may be interested in the uh, how uh, much it can endure the uh, water pressure. So uh, sometimes uh, it is saying that ATM as a unit for the uh, waterproof. So 10 ATM means 100 meter. Okay, so that's a uh, um, practical implication of this pressure unit. So this is kind of a, uh, for your understanding, so whole atmosphere, if whole atmosphere is the way like this much, if it is mercury, the column height is gonna be uh, 76 uh, centimeter, and then if it is water, it's gonna be 10 meter, all right? So this is whole concept of, about the uh, pressure. So this seems like we, although we, you know, don't feel any uh, pressure of the air, but if you have water on top of your head, that's 10 meters of water, it is very heavy thing. I don't know how much did you dive into the water, but if you just dive into a few meters, you can definitely feel the, uh, the, uh, <coughs> the weight of the water. So why people doesn't feel the, uh, the atmosphere pressure? Because we have a counter pressure inside our body that can exert this at, at, uh, air pressure, right? So I talked about, uh, we will discuss about uh, the uh, uh, distribution of pressure and temperature uh, as a function of altitude. So this is the distribution. So air pressure on the surface is, uh, so uh, sea level pressure, sometimes we call it a uh, uh, unit as Torricelli or, or millimeter HG. And then there are all sort of the uh, uh, different um, 
uh, units out there to uh, uh, talk about uh, air pressure. So here, they, they use the hectopascal. So uh, in terms of hectopascal unit, uh, uh, sea level uh, pressure is about 1,013 uh, hectopascal. So uh, as you can see here, the pressure is decreasing as a function of altitude, but not linear way, but exponential decay. So I talked, I think last discussion section, Ian talked about uh, exponential E. How many of you know about E as a number? Um, about one third. So E is just a number, just like pi, endless number, 2.7, yada, 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 yada. So it happens to be, it's a lot of uh, uh, phenomenon uh, in nature can be explained by uh, the, that exponential number. So uh, scientists love to use that exponential. But if we are not familiar with the exponential, one thing you need to remember is that there's a linear decrease or linear increase or exponential decrease or exponential uh, uh, decrease or increase out there. So in this case, the pressure is changing very quickly uh, as a function of altitude. We usually call this kind of a, a fast uh, decrease as exponential uh, decrease, right? So uh, linear uh, decrease, on the other hand, is going to be expressed as a line, right? So it is uh, decreasing much, much faster day than, uh, way than the uh, uh, linear decrease, right? So uh, if you want to visualize this thing, so air molecule is basically uh, heavily concentrated on the surface, and then less air is up high, right? That's, uh, that's why up high, there's far much less uh, air molecule that actually dictates the uh, lower pressure. And then there's much more, much, uh, far much uh, more air molecule on the uh, sea level. That's why we have high pressure uh, on the sea level, right? So if you want to visualize the air molecule uh, perspective, you can visualize this way, all right? So uh, this is uh, explanation of the uh, number E. So E is 2.71, that's kind of a unlimited kind of sequencing is going on. So this is a quick summary of the atmospheric pressure unit. I introduced about Torricelli, millimeter mercury, and the millibar and hectopascal. But uh, for the MKS unit perspective, the hectopascal and the millibar is the global standard. But in some region, chemists really love ATM. It's much easier to understand. So basically, one ATM means the uh, atmospheric pressure on the sea level. So Irvine is about the uh, uh, atmospheric pressure. So uh, the pressure out here should be about 1 atm. So uh, different altitude obviously has different um, pressure. Uh, I explained ab about the Irvine. Irvine is a uh, sea level <coughs> above 63 meter, which is not that high. And then uh, atmosp atmospheric pressure is very close to uh, 1 atm. So Big Bear Lake, if you just go up high, about 6,700 uh, feet, which is 20, uh, 60 meter, uh, pressure gets 25% less than the sea level. And then um, the Loveland ski area in Colorado. So this is the ski area located most uh, highest level, at least in the United States. Uh, uh, the, uh, the mountain top of this ski area is about 4,000 meter. So um, the air density, uh, air pressure is about 60% uh, than what we have in Irvine. So uh, there's a couple of news always uh, coming along. Uh, this time of the season when uh, that uh, ski area is opening, a lot of people from uh, Nebraska, a place like that on the sea level, kind of drives up, very excited about the uh, new season and then uh, coming to the ski area and then overnight and then they just got passed out because of the, uh, this low pressure. So when you uh, travel this high altitude area, you gotta take the enough rest and then take a lot of water, things like that. So let's go up a little higher. So this is uh, uh, Mount McKinley in Alaska. This is the highest point in North America, uh, which is uh, altitude of 61, see, almost 6,200 uh, meter. Uh, the air pressure is only 43% of what you have right now. And then this is the uh, highest point on Earth, it's only 30%. So that's why people are wearing this oxygen mask because the pressure is low, there's less air there, so they need some support uh, from the, uh, uh, this gas tank 
to get yeah, enough oxygen out of it. And this is another example to understand um, the air pressure and the human behavior. Anybody, anybody is following the uh, long, professional long distance learning? Probably not. It seems like I'm, I'm the only few people <laughs> actually following this thing. So her name is Kara Goucher. So she's kind of a Tiger Woods or the uh, uh, Tom Brady of the long distance learning, all right? And uh, she, uh, so she, actually she went to college at the University of Colorado, we call it CU, because UC taking UC, so they, they are calling themselves uh, as CU. So CU is located in Boulder, Colorado. I happened to stay there for and a half years before I came out here. And um, so CU athletic program is, uh, you know, football program is, is not, it's okay, but I think it's, I would call it just mediocre, and then everything is just okay. But their uh, track and field program is really, really good because uh, Boulder, Colorado uh, altitude is about mile high. So it is about 80% of the uh, atmospheric pressure. So it is the perfect place to uh, actually practice the uh, uh, long distance running. So she turned to a uh, professional, and then what she's doing um, now is that she maintaining her bedroom at 12,000 feet uh, high altitude, basically at uh, the air pressure of the 60.6 uh, atm. So she is breathing the thin air, 60% of air, uh, while she's sleeping to uh, just uh, increase her uh, processing of the oxygen in her body kind of thing. So, Altitude and pressure is always going along together. So that's one thing that I would like to, you to remember um, from this old kind of a interesting example that I showed you. So unlikely the pressure, the temperature is changing really differently. So there are uh, four different layer of atmosphere we are talking about. The first thing you need to remember, so in this plot, is that this is temperature, happened to be in Kelvin. And then we usually call it uh, the atmospheric uh, height. So the top of the atmosphere is about 100 kilometer, all right? So 100 kilometer is about top of the atmosphere. Probably out of the 100 kilometer, you can call it space from there. Um, and then there are four layer of the air. On the bottom, there's troposphere. And the, um, on top of that, there's stratosphere, and the mesosphere, and thermosphere. Uh, in this class, we are not going to talk about mesosphere and thermosphere. We'll be talking about stratosphere a little bit, uh, actually quite a bit, towards the end of the class. And then we'll talk a lot about the uh, troposphere because this is the, uh, the air that we breathe, right? So in troposphere, temperature is decreasing, right? Probably you can feel it. If you go up higher, it's much colder, so that's why. That's, uh, not why. So that's how you observe this the, uh, temperature decrease in the troposphere. So a practical implication of this uh, decreasing uh, temperature of the altitude is that basically on the uh, uh, in the uh, bottom layer, temperature is higher than um, the upper layer. So uh, temperature is higher. That means the air is light, right? The, uh, uh, low temperature air mass, probably much heavier, right? So uh, that means troposphere is unstable. The circulation should be going on, right? That's why we have a weather phenomenon. Uh, things like that is happening. So we will discuss about it later. And the stratosphere, the so temperature uh, in the stratosphere actually increasing over the uh, uh, altitude. If you go up high, the temperature is actually increasing. That means the uh, uh, stratosphere is stable, right? It's kind of a, uh, stable because of the uh, temperature distribution. That's why we have a stable ozone layer in the stratosphere, right? So we'll discuss about troposphere a little bit, uh, quite a bit, and then uh, stratosphere also when we discuss about uh, stratospheric ozone. So that's all you need to know in terms of temperature and pressure distribution uh, over the altitude. And then how those temperature and pressure are related. In the now we are getting back to uh, uh, chemistry uh, world now. 
So there are three different laws out there that dictate the uh, uh, gas behavior. We call it uh, equation of a state. So Boyle's law is that basically pressure and volume is anticorrelated. So if you uh, express this thing on the plot, then really good. So which means that if you express volume in y-axis, and then pressure in x-axis, it's going to be look like this way, right? So which means that if you have this balloon thing, if you pressurize this thing before it just got exploded, the volume is going to be, sh be shrinked, right? So that's basically what this means. And then Charles' law is, So if pressure is constant, if you kind of increase of the temperature, then volume is going to be going up, right? And V. But one uh, assumption of that uh, law is that pressure should be constant. So let's find out really that's the case or not. So I have a thermometer here. And then in here, so some fume is coming out, kind of dropping some liquid here. It's just gone. Can you guess what this thing is? Liquid nitrogen. So nitrogen in liquid form, all right? So right now, the temperature in the room is, anybody have a reading? What's the temperature? 22. 22 Celsius, right? Let's see. 22 degrees Celsius. And then let's measure the temperature of this thing. Just going down, going down. Actually, this is out of scale, should be. So it's below minus 100 degrees Celsius right now. So what's the temperature of the uh, liquid nitrogen here? In Celsius, I'm not talking about Fahrenheit in this oh, classroom. Yeah, negative 196 degrees Celsius. 100, 196? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's when it boils. So probably the temperature inside of this balloon, the air inside of this balloon should be about the same as the room temperature, right? So if we put this thing inside of this uh, low temperature, let's see what's going to be happening. So we're gone, right? Hey, wanna do another thing? <laughs> we can actually put all these different things here. It's all gone, right? Let's go away. Basically, the temperature gets lower and the volume is decreased, right? Let's see what's gonna happen if we bring these things out. Quickly going back, right? No so, this is kind of fun, but uh, our science job is to make this thing boring by making this equation, all right? That's our job. So, uh, this is kind of a Charles law. And then Avogadro's law is kind of interesting, is that Regardless of, of the uh, gas molecule's characteristic, there's the same number of the uh, gas molecule should be in there in constant temperature and pressure and volume. And then he defines new uh, uh, unit called small, which is about 22.4 liters. And then uh, pressure is 1 atm, the sea level uh, pressure, and then temperature of I think zero degrees Celsius, there should be number of molecule of 6.20 times 10 to 23 molecules per moles out there. So that's how many uh, number of molecules in given volume, regardless of the, uh, uh, the uh, characteristic of gases. So that's 
That being said, that uh, oxygen or nitrogen or whatever uh, molecule you can think of, that if it is gas, then number of molecules in one, uh, one mole should be this much, all right? So if you somehow integrate all these things together as a one equation, you can get the, uh, this equation, which is, this is kind of a, the equation that, that governing uh, pressure, uh, volume, and temperature of all, which is PV equals NLT. So you know pressure, you know volume, you know temperature, and then N is number of moles, and then R is constant to make an equation right here, right? So let's use the equation to uh, understand how this uh, balloon thing can bring people up high. So uh, this is late 1700, just a couple of kind of pictures out there. So there are two, way, two different ways you can make this balloon that you can just you know, going up. So basically what you want to do, this balloon thing, is that total weight that can compose uh, this volume. If you can make this volume way less than the actual air, you will get the buoyancy, right? Right? So uh, there's a number of molecules. So what it meant by the uh, number, uh, the, uh, the less, uh, uh, less weight is that a less of less uh, uh, air molecule, if you have a less air molecule in this balloon than the, uh, the air outside, then um, you will get the buoyancy, right? So there's a balloon thing here, which is here. And then uh, let's arrange this equation as And I said, this is constant, right? So this is not changing. And then pressure should be constant, right? So because that um, basically this is equilibrated with the outside and inside uh, pressure. So uh, pressure is same. So volume is about the same too. So, uh, so one thing you can do, you can increase the uh, temperature, then this gonna be a decreasing. So when it, so these days a lot of people using the uh, uh, kind of a heating up inside this balloon so they get the buoyancy, right? Another way you can do is that number of molecule in the given volume and given pressure, it, we said that that should be the same, that's Avogadro's law. So if you use the lighter um, um, gas like helium, then the number of the uh, uh, gas molecule inside this balloon and then air in the, in the volume should be about the same. But if you happen to use like helium, which is four gram per mole, right? And then air is 20% of oxygen, 80% of nitrogen, and then oxygen is about 32, 32 gram per mole. Nitrogen is 28 gram per mole. And then it's 20%, 8%. So it should be about 29.2 gram per mole. <coughs> so because it is far less light, if you fill this uh, balloon with helium, then it's gonna be, it's, it's gonna get the buoyancy, right? It's gonna be flying to the sky. But back in old days, there's no technique you can get the uh, helium. So uh, a lot of people use the hydrogen, but hydrogen is ex explosive. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of accidents were actually happening uh, while they are flying uh, with this thing, all right? So, I talked about 20% oxygen and 20% of nitrogen. So this is composition of the air. So uh, more uh, accurately uh, saying, the nitrogen is about 78.08%. Uh, uh, and then oxygen is about 21%. So 
So if you add up, this is 99%, 99.3%, something like that, right? And then uh, there's some very inert species out there, argon, neon, helium, krypton, and xenon. So that's the older compounds sitting right here. So the, uh, the element that's sitting all, all, all the way to the right is a very sta stable uh, atom. So they are not really participating in any reaction in the atmosphere. So which means that 99.96% uh, uh, of the uh, air uh, is not really reactive. They are, they are just staying in the atmosphere, and then they are not really air pollutants. And then the, the, the air pollutants are actually 0.03% of the air, all right? Very tiny fraction of the uh, uh, air uh, constituent, but still it, is, it uh, affects the uh, human health and then everything like uh, global uh, climate change, things like that. So uh, this uh, is the visualization of the air composition. So nitrogen, mostly nitrogen, about 78.1%. Uh, and then oxygen is about 21%. And then tiny fraction of this part is there are some other compounds other than nitrogen, uh, nitrogen or oxygen. But if you uh, kind of uh, take a look at this small part and then getting the composition of this small part again, most of them are composed by CO2, about 0.035%. So uh, last time we talked about unit, PPM, PPB, and PPT. So that is uh, point, yeah. worse. This is better. The next person probably should throw this thing away. So 0.035% of CO2 that I mentioned about. So 1% means one out of 100, right? So uh, if you change this thing into ppm, ppm is one molecule out of 10 to 6 molecule, right? So it's going to be 350 ppm, right? This is how it works in terms of the uh, uh, the uh, mixing ratio of the unit of the uh, uh, concentration of the air. So mostly CO2, and then this hydrogen, krypton, neon, helium are all staying right here, inert gas. And then there's a tiny fraction of the methane, which is 0.00017%, which is about 1.7 ppm. So this is CO2. This is methane. And then we briefly talked about air pollutants like CO, SO2, and ozone. It's not really even exist in this picture. It looks like it's, it, the concentration of the uh, ozone, SO2, CO kind of, uh, kind of air pollutants are much, much lower than uh, this concentration, which means that really, really tiny fraction of the uh, air composition, right? So. We will discuss about, about five different air pollution problems. So one is indoor air pollution, and then outdoor urban air pollution. There are two kinds of uh, smog. So basically, they say smog. So uh, smog we will talk about. One is London type of smog, and then Los Angeles type smog. And then acid rain. And then towards the end of the quarter, we will discuss about stratospheric ozone de uh, depletion and then global climate change for the last topic of this quarter. So there are a number of gases and particles uh, affecting all these different kind of uh, uh, pollution problem. So there are some overlap, and then there's a unique uh, chemical compound actually affecting the, uh, each um, air pollution uh, phenomenon. So uh, at this time point, all, only you need to remember is that there's a gases and particles affecting on each uh, air pollution problems, and then there are about five different air uh, pollution problems that we will discuss this during this whole quarter, all right? 
So let's talk about CO2 and methane a little bit. So we'll talk about a lot about sources and sinks. So let's, let's talk about this sources and sink concept a little bit. So we love conceptualize as a uh, atmospheric chemist as a box. So you have box here. And then, then let's call it this as atmosphere or air. Then uh, what we meant by source is that there gotta be something that emits some gases, right? In this case, CO2. So at the first class, we discussed about definition of air pollution. So if it becomes the air pollution problem, this source should be related with human activity, right? The natural cycle doesn't count as air pollution, right? So in terms of CO2, there are a lot of natural sources out there. So they are not the problem, right? So bacteria fermentation, obviously at this time point, you and me emitted a lot of CO2. Actually, that's not really a problem at this time point. So they are, there, there are a whole bunch of natural sources, but the problem that we have right now is a, a human source, and in most cases, that's fossil fuel burning, right? So that's the definition of source. Let's move this thing away a little bit. And then things is that, Eventually, this got to be going somewhere, right? In terms of CO2, a lot of CO2 is removed from the atmosphere by photosynthesis, right? So some, we will talk about, uh, we will talk a lot sometimes about atmospheric lifetime of some gases or particle. So basically, if you have faster loss rate, then your lifetime of this molecule <coughs> is going to be lifetime. Yeah, lifetime of this uh, molecule going to be short, right? If there's not many processes removing uh, some specific <coughs> gas compound from the atmosphere, then lifetime of that compound is going to be very long. So for example, nitrogen, which is about 80% of atmosphere, the lifetime of the uh, uh, Nitrogen is about a couple of million years, which is long lifetime. So that's how nitrogen can build up to the atmosphere because there's no really good mechanism that remove nitrogen from the atmosphere, right? So there's something is keep up. Uh, there are sources there, and then nitrogen is coming out from the uh, to the atmosphere. And then there's not many uh, sink process in the atmosphere. Then uh, the uh, the concentration it's going to be large, right? So um, if you uh, go back, we take a look at the, uh, all those uh, lower concentration compounds, that means that the lifetime of that thing is really short, or the uh, source is uh, really kind of a, a weak, then uh, uh, the concentration can be really low. But a lot of cases, the sink is uh, dominating the lifetime of a specific compounds, right? So that's the concept of the sources and sinks. So uh, there's a health effects kind of kicking in once uh, CO2 concentration gas uh, uh, 10 or 30,000 ppm. But usually, probably the uh, CO2 concentration in this room or outside is close to 400 ppm. So in um, usual cases, this is not really a problem. But if you're getting into some sort of a, a combustion thing is going on in this room, that may uh, increase the CO2 quite a bit. But uh, uh, usually, uh, any environment actually uh, gets uh, CO2 concentration this high, right? So this is a big picture of the how CO2 is behaving in our system. So I talked about that source from uh, human activity is uh, the problem. So this natural uh, kind of a, a source, like soil aspiration and then volcano, uh, not counted as a pollution. So in terms of CO2, the pollution is really a problem uh, from the uh, fossil fuel burning. And then maybe deforestation and land use change, 
because, uh, for example, uh, in Amazon, there's a lot of deforestation going on. So a lot of plants can actually uh, take, uh, cut the uh, lar large uh, volume of CO2 to as a plant. But if you can rid of trees, then uh, there's no, no CO2. There's not much of CO2 getting into the uh, ecosystem. So that can be the problem. So um, this is Charles Killing. I think he passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, he was at the uh, UCSD, uh, Scripps Institute of Oceanography. And then right now, actually, his son is conducting this research right now. So in our uh, late 50, he brought an uh, analytical system that can accurately measure CO2 to on top of Mauna Loa, Hawaii. So that's the, uh, big, uh, the mountain in the big island. So altitude of this Mauna Loa, I think higher than 12,000 feet, something like that, very high observatory. And then he started measuring CO2. So this, so when you uh, see this kind of plot, what you gotta do first is that you gotta take a look at the x-axis and then what the y-axis means. In this case, x-axis is the year, and then uh, y-axis is CO2 concentration, what he observed. <coughs> So clearly you can see CO2 concentration has been increased, uh, probably due to, definitely due to uh, human activity. But there's a little kind of a cycle is going on. But if you kind of expand this cycle, this is annual cycle. So basically, in April, it is keep increasing uh, from the fall till all, uh, all the way out to the uh, April. So this is Northern Hemisphere. And then from the spring, CO2 concentration is decreasing. So this kind of annual cycle, uh, we can observe this kind of annual cycle every year when he started uh, make observation of CO2 at Mount Loa, Loa from the uh, late uh, 50. So let's do the uh, little clicker question here. So why that is happening? So everybody getting the uh, um, attendance credit today, I guess. So who's going A? More car traffic in the summer. Anybody brave enough to explain something out here? The answers, answer it and then explain the um, justify your answer kind of thing. Anybody? So uh, the question is, why CO2 concentration is high in late spring, and then uh, CO2 concentration is lowest point in uh, late summer, early fall, which is about this year, about this time of the year, right? So why is that? Yep? Uh, it's more, I mean, A would make sense because more people are coming in from like the mainland to go to Hawaii during the summertime, because it's more vacation. Yeah, that can be, that can be. But that's not the answer that I'm looking for, but anybody? Yep. Um, I'd probably say more plants because of like spring, you know, springtime and then like when fall, they kind of lose Yeah, so that's, that's the, uh, what we are thinking right now. So if you take a look at the, the so this is North Hemisphere. So this is about uh, spring begins, right, in April. So um, from the April in Northern Hemisphere, the leaves are coming along and then photosynthesis is getting active, right? So plants are taking CO2 during the whole summer. That's why actual CO2 concentration is decreasing of the whole summer. And then beginning of the uh, late uh, summer and then early September, the leaves are falling and then uh, it gets the, uh, uh, um, um, it gets the uh, uh, fall then there's no active photosynthesis is going on. So there's no um, plant uptakes. So CO2 is increasing all the way out to the uh, early spring. So this is how you, under, you can understand this annual cycle, right? So there's two things you need to uh, take away from this plot. One is past uh, over six, 60 years, CO2 uh, concentration increased quite a bit. And then there's pattern of the annual cycle, which is from um, uh, plant activity. Um, uh, the photosynthesis actually taking the CO2 away from the atmosphere. All right, there's two um, concepts that uh, you need to learn from this plot. 
So uh, we talked about uh, CO2. Let's talk a little bit about methane. So methane also has sources and sinks. Again, the natural sources is not really air pollution problem. So all the uh, human-made source, sources are the air pollution problem. So uh, one um, problem that we are going to talk about is about, uh, obviously, fossil fuel combustion. And then we'll talk about a little bit about the Arctic Regency uh, methane. So um, probably you heard a lot of times about the uh, Arctic ice is melting away. And then places like Siberia, it has been a permafrost. It has been frozen uh, whole years, it used to be. But uh, or it gets warmer. And then those uh, um, permafrost is kind of a melted away. And then there's a, happened to be a lot of methane is trapped under that ice. So uh, we are kind of a little bit worried about, so actually we worried a lot about that, all those methane trapped underneath of that uh, uh, permafrost if that gets into the atmosphere, it can, we, we are thinking it can, it, it'll be a disaster. So a lot of research is going on right now. So we'll discuss, discuss about it uh, towards the end of the, uh, this quarter when we discuss about the uh, uh, climate change, right? So uh, just like the uh, CO2, methane has been increased past about 10, 20 years. But somehow, the methane level uh, past uh, about 10 years has been stabilized. And then one, fact, one fun fact about methane, about 20% of, of the methane emission in the US actually coming from cow and beef. They are emitting a lot of methane. And then in Central Valley, there's a really big operation going on in terms of feed rod and then a kind of a dairy, things like that. So there's a lot of uh, methane is coming from the, uh, uh, this uh, beef industry. And then we are estimating about 20% of methane in the US is actually coming from this uh, beef industry. Uh, that's kind of a fun fact. So that CO2 and methane are very important uh, greenhouse gases, but that has not been regulated, regulated at least in this country uh, by EPA. And then there are six uh, EPA designated air pollutants are listed here. So at least you got to remember the name of these guys, right? So uh, one is carbon monoxide, which is CO, and then particulate matter. So we call it aerosol, right? So this particle happened to be in the atmosphere, right? And then NO2, SO2, and ozone. Again, this ozone, we call it air pollutants. It's not the ozone sitting in the stratosphere. So this is the ozone that actually uh, exists in the uh, troposphere, lower atmosphere. So this is a problem for the uh, breathing. So, so when we breathe ozone, that's, that is not good for our respiratory system. And then uh, lead. So there are six different air pollutants that EPA actually has guideline, and then they enforce the uh, source, the human source, things like that uh, by the law. So let's talk about CO. So CO is coming from, so there's some, some chemical characteristic of CO, deadly, colorless, odorless, poisonous gas. It's kind of you know, very scary. And then um, where it is coming from? Incomplete burning of various fuel, coal, wood, charcoal, oil, kerosene, propane, all different things. But uh, these all different things, the common uh, chemical characteristic of all these different things are Organic compounds. Anybody can explain organic compound? What organic compound is? Yep, go for it. Go for it. Don't need to raise hands. Just shout it. Yeah, carbon structured compound, right? So I should throw that thing away too. I'm throwing away one by one. So carbon-based compound, for example, this, so there's one carbon, that's methane. So uh, this thick thing is hydrogen. But we scientists are lazy, so we just uh, put the sticks in it. So there's a two carbon, single bond, ethane, propane, butane. And then we are even lazier. Sometimes we do this. So, so each of these things has carbon 
like this. So you don't need to remember notation, things like that, but this is carbon-based compounds. So once it is burning, what's going to be coming out? There's oxygen in the atmosphere, right? So there's some reaction going on. Then what's going to be coming out? If it is completely burned, then it should be CO2, right? So incomplete combustion by means that it's not completely taking uh, oxygen, molecular oxygen uh, away. It's so rather have just one oxygen. Then it becomes CO. That's uh, by definition incomplete combustion, right? But CO2 is not really a problem in terms of your health, but CO is very toxic. So there's an uh, uh, interesting article, not interesting article, it's actually a tragic prob uh, incident. So that's Denver Post article, if we take a look at this. So this is a story about one family. So obviously, they are very wealthy. So they got their new house in Aspen, a couple of million dollars worth. And then they had the first night in that house. And then they got killed by CO poisoning. They uh, happened to, I think, turn, they probably wood burning uh, fireplace, things like that. They had that thing in there. So this article was about they, the uh, family actually sued the inspector that because you know, he didn't find out this thing right away, so they got killed. So, but um, they uh, didn't win that lawsuit. So kind of, a, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about a law thing here, but there's a kind of some, something going on. So you can read this whole thing about this thing. So after this actually accident, uh, state of Colorado enforced to have CO monitor, CO detector, every household. So this is the map that the uh, uh, state-wide uh, regulation in terms of having a CO detector. Obviously, California is one of them. So if you are from one of these states, not regulated, does not require any CO detector have in your home, just please have it. It can be, uh, it can be great. So you either save your life eventually. Um, so the uh, state of Colorado right here actually started that regulation after that accident, I think 2010 or something like that. So, so all, the prob all these things can actually make the, uh, the CO, excess CO in the room. Like uh, garage, if you turn on your car, if an uh, uh, engine is on, there can be a CO coming out. Obviously, the fuel of a car is all this carbon-based, so incomplete combustion can produce a lot of excess CO. And then somehow, if you are isolated in the garage, you know, you get, you get intoxicated by CO. And then all those burning things in, in, uh, indoors can make the CO um, um, indoor uh, pollution, like uh, kerosene burning uh, heater. And then if you have a charcoal uh, um, grill indoor, that can be a problem. And then uh, even the natural gas burning um, a dryer or heater, things like that, they can cause all this excess CO uh, in your room. So uh, just be aware if you're operating this thing in your, ha in your house or indoor, just uh, try to open the window, things like that, so that not to get intoxicated. So problem of this CO again is uh, deadly. That's a big problem. But the problem is it's colorless. So we cannot see it. Odorless, we cannot smell it. So you don't know. At some time point, you're just going to just uh, um, die after just you're breathing this thing too much, all right? So wake up <laughs> if you're sleepy, if you're sleepy this afternoon. And then we'll talk about NO2. So first thing was CO, the first thing, and then NO2. So NO2 happened to be, actually, it can be seen if the concentration is very high. So it's brown color. So this is kind of glass jar. And then it trapped CO2 very, very high concentration. And then it has brown color. And then uh, if it gets 80 ppb, if you are a sensitive group, you may feel the sore throat. And then actually, a lot of places, uh, NO2 concentration easily can over 80 ppb, especially rush hour. 
So usually the typical polluted air has a couple of hundred ppb. So again, ppb is one molecule out of billion molecules. So this is a really small fraction of the atmosphere, but still this can affect your health and then uh, it can cause a lot of uh, problem by the, the uh, secondary uh, reaction in the atmosphere. So why it has brown color? That's kind of an interesting science question. So NO2, so you, you remember visible wavelength region from about 400 to the uh, 750 nanometer, right? So shorter wavelength has a blue color and then uh, um, um, longer wavelengths in visible spectrum region has a red color. And then you can see the rainbow here. So this NO2 absorption <coughs> spectrum, which means that so NO2 molecule can absorb this wavelength this much of the uh, uh, photons, the wave, this wavelength and this much, which means that NO2 is taking away this much of the visible light from here to there. So basically, your eyes here, and then that jar thing is here, very high NO2 concentration. And then light is going to be traveling like this way, right? And then NO2 is going to take away this wavelength region about 400 to 500, so this much. And then if you just mix all this color, light of color together, it's going to be look like this way, all right? Actually, this is kind of dramatic. You may think that it's kind of dramatic experiment that just prints so much NO2 in the one jar, and then you can see the NO2. Actually, if you go traveling a very polluted region, especially in the uh, rush hour, you can see this brownish color over the, uh, over the uh, highway, they are all from NO2. So NO2 is mostly coming from traffic. And then SO2. So SO2, last time I talked about, there are natural source, which is volcano, right? But uh, uh, SO2 can come from, um, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, human-made SO2 is coming from power plant. Coal burning power plants emits a lot of SO2. So this is the uh, kind of a SO2 range, concentration range. It's also a couple of, uh, couple of ppb to about 1,000 ppb. So um, actually, there will be, it, it becomes a health uh, hazard, uh, SO2 concentration higher than 1,000 ppb. But there's not many places in the world SO2 concentration high, higher than the 1,000 ppb, unless you breathe directly something coming from the volcano or something from the, uh, um, the, the stack gas from the uh, uh, coal power plants. So uh, develop, developed world, like United States, has been doing a really great job in terms of decreasing SO2. Again, if you see the, this kind of plot, you got to read x-axis. In this case, this is year. And then y-axis is the uh, SO2 monitors. This is uh, uh, a concentration of SO2 that was measured in New York State of New York. So as you can see, SO2 concentration kept decreasing over about 40 years. So a uh, uh, country like uh, US has been really uh, doing great job in terms of SO2 reduction. But uh, this is a research paper um, that est estimating um, SO2 emission uh, in an uh, East Asian country. Uh, for example, mostly uh, the SO2 emission in East Asia dictated by China. And as you can see, uh, this is the other direction, right? From 1980 to, uh, uh, to the uh, recent, uh, recently, uh, the SO2 concentration kept increasing. And then, uh, sorry about that. I should be making mute. Um, so this has been a big environmental problem out there in East Asian country. And then let's talk about uh, ozone a little bit. So we talked about CO, NO2, and SO2 so far, right? So those three compounds have source, so the clear sources of, from the uh, human activity. So in terms of CO, it's uh, incomplete in, in combustion. 
And then NO2 is a, a car exhaust, and SO2 is coal burning power plant. But different from that three compounds, uh, ozone is actually reaction products of NO2 and um, organic compounds in the atmosphere. So this which means that there's no direct source of the ozone from human activity. Rather, ozone is chemically formed in the atmosphere with the material that human emitted, all right? So that's the clear distinction between CO, SO10, NO2, and ozone. So here the source is atmospheric photochemical reaction. So you may think this can be either pollution or not pollution because it is not really don't have human uh, source of the ozone uh, uh, in the atmosphere. But there's uh, some level of ozone that is uh, actually safe enough you can breathe, which is about 20 to 40 ppb. So even in clean air, ozone concentration is somewhere between 20 to 40 ppb. But the problem is that ozone uh, uh, concentration increase due to uh, high NO2 concentration and the high CO concentration that cause atmospheric reaction that produce ozone in the atmosphere. So because the source of the, this ozone pollution are coming from human activity, now we start to call it uh, ozone as air pollut pollutants, all right? So that's how um, we categorize it. So ozone, so this is, has a three oxygen atom. It's very high, high uh, very reactive oxidant in the atmosphere. So um, a lot of uh, uh, the rubber actually lose its the, uh, uh, material characteristic, which is uh, usually it is bending pretty well, but uh, because of the oxidation of the surface, it got cracked. And then uh, another problem of the uh, uh, ozone pollution, of, of course, that uh, is bad for the, uh, your uh, respiratory uh, health system, but it is actually decreasing the uh, crop yield. For example, ozone concentration, the yearly ozone concentration average gets about 60 or 80 ppb. I told you that uh, the uh, healthy level of ozone concentration is below 40. So in below 40, uh, we, we expect the, uh, this much of the uh, crop yield of the corn or wheat, things like that. But uh, when uh, ozone concentration gets high, your crop yield actually decreases because that, uh, the plants are actually affected by this uh, high uh, uh, oxidant like ozone in the atmosphere. So we talked about CO, NO2, SO2, and ozone. They are all gases, right? So we'll talk about particulate matter, which is uh, PM, which is aerosol. So um, the particulate matter we are worrying about right now is a really tiny, tiny um, uh, part particle. So we usually call it PM0.1, uh, PM2.5, and then PM10. So number, so PM, of course, uh, in, uh, uh, abbreviation of the particulate matter, but this number out here is micrometer. So PM10 is uh, particulate matter below the 10 micrometer, PM2.5 is below 2.5 micrometer, so micro is 10 to minus 6, right? One meter is about three fifths, so uh, it's really tiny, tiny uh, uh, particulate matter. And then PM0.1 is the uh, uh, particulate matter smaller than uh, 0.1 micrometer. So it's, it's not larger than, it's smaller than uh, 0.1 micrometer. So usually large particle, <coughs> usually animal has uh, capability to filter out uh, in their breathing system. But these kind of small, um, small uh, particle actually gets into your lung. So it depends on the particle size. A little bit larger particle like PM10 um, gets about here in your lung. And then it gets smaller actually it gets penetrated much deeper, and then it causes a more bigger problem uh, in, the, in your uh, uh, lung health. So this is photo of lung who exposed the long time of the uh, uh, air pollution. You can see the, uh, this uh, kind of black thingy, the atmospheric particle actually kind of penetrating in your lung and kind of stuck in your lung uh, um, tissue. So this is uh, kind of a make you scary, try to make you scary if you expose uh, this uh, air pollution too much. Although you are not a smoker, your lung 
may change like this. There's a lot of particle there. So to avoid this uh, kind of a, a particle problem, I told you that uh, China, recent uh, economic development, there's a lot of air pollution problem going on. So it's a must have item in China these days, is the having mask. And then obviously young people want wearing this kind of a nice looking trendy kind of mask things out there. So if you are the art major or business major, you're kind of a money making machine thing out there. So even in the air pollution class, you can get some idea about the uh, business idea, things like that, I guess. So think about it. So this is the plot that showing uh, the health uh, problem and air pollution problems, how they are related. So again, x-axis and y-axis. So x-axis is the uh, uh, PM concentration over a long time, over five years. And then y-axis, basically you can think that number of people died due to lung problem, all right? So what this thing is showing is that higher uh, part particulate concentration, the people died more due to lung issue, right? So this is what he's talking about. So uh, this is a very striking plot that we had about 10 years ago. So now people realize actually this uh, particle uh, issue, even in the US, that uh, it can cause a lot of death uh, due to uh, the particle late matter penetrate in your lung and then they can shrink your kind of lifetime also. So this is an interesting plot, you can take a look. So another thing is abastos. So abastos has been used as an uh, insulator uh, in home. So uh, the house, house is built before the 70, this kind of a um, mineral that uh, looks like needle. So as people breathe this thing, this needle thing kind of a penetrate into the lung tissue that caused a lot of cancer, things like problems, mesothelioma, things like that. It's all caused by this uh, tiny, uh, tiny uh, particle in the atmosphere. So finally, we will talk about lead. Before we talk about this thing, let's watch this YouTube clip. Oh. I want to hear you. Less from, less from the beginning. Thomas Smithley Jr. was born in 1889 in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. His father was an inventor, and young Thomas had a great interest in gadgetry, science, and invention, as well as music, history, and poetry. Growing up in Columbus, Ohio, he was always fascinated with his father's inventions, which primarily revolved around automobile tires. Determined to follow in his father's footsteps as an inventor, Midgley graduated from Cornell University in 1911 with a degree in mechanical engineering. Following a brief year of working on the design of cash registers, he joined his father in developing car tires and auto parts. After a lack of financial success on his own, he joined Dayton Engineering Laboratories Company, which would later be acquired by General Motors. This was 1916. Midgley was 27. One problem at the time was that of engine knock. This was a loud noise made by the engine that indicated a loss of power from too rapid ignition of fuel. Midgley and colleagues were brainstorming, came up with the idea of dyeing the fuel red so that it would absorb more radiant heat. The only red dye they had on hand was iodine. To their surprise, the addition of only a small percentage iodine almost completely eliminated the knocking problem. This was serendipity because the iodine, not its color, was responsible for the change. The iodine was altering the octane level of the gasoline fuel, allowing for the more desirable high compression ratios to be used without the loss of power from knocking. Experimentation showed that the most effective fuel additive to increase octane rating was a formulation of organic lead called tetraethyl lead, or TEL. The lead, along with a pink-tinted bromo and chloroethane mixture, were added to the fuel. This mixture, simply called ethyl, can still be found in high-octane aviation fuel, and in a few countries around the world. However, from the very beginning, the toxicity of the lead was noticed. 
17 workers at the plant that made the organic lead compound died from lead poisoning. But it wouldn't be until the early 1950s that the full impact of leaded gasoline would be felt. Claire Patterson, trying to solve the problem of the age of the Earth, found that atmospheric lead isotopes in his ice core samples were incredibly high in the last few decades. He was able to very accurately date the increase to the adoption of ethyl, and the EPA launched an investigation, which ultimately led to the banning of leaded gasoline in virtually every country on Earth, even China, which switched over in 2001. But Midgley still had more to contribute. After ethyl had been successfully made and sold around the world, he turned his attention to the development of better refrigerant, one that would be safe, non-flammable, and free of toxicity. He quickly found one that fit the bill, dichlorodifluoromethane, the first commercial chlorofluorocarbon, Freon. It was so wildly successful, so completely non-toxic, that it was used in hundreds of ways, air conditioners, refrigerators, mosquito sprayers, aerosol cans, asthma inhalers, virtually anywhere you needed an inert gas. It was a fantastically successful product. In 1941, the American Chemical Society gave Midgley its highest award, the Priestley Medal, and followed up with the Willard Gibbs Medal in 1942. He also held two honorary degrees and was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. In 1944, he was president and chairman of the American Chemical Society. It wouldn't be until 1973, when chemists Frank Rowland and Mario Molina noticed the impact that all those inert CFC molecules were having on our protective ozone layer. A year later, those scientists were called to testify before Congress, and by 1982, CFCs were starting to be banned internationally, and the world reacted in horror to pictures from space showing gaping holes in our atmosphere's protective layer. Tom Midley wouldn't be around to see the results of his work. In 1940, at the age of 51, he contracted polio and was severely disabled. Being largely bedbound, he devised an ingenious system of pulleys and cables to assist his movement in and out of bed. Four years later, he was found dead, strangled to death by his own invention after he became accidentally entangled. We might see this as a fitting in for a man who made both great and terrible contributions to the field of engineering and innovation. His most ingenious innovations often had the most horrifying outcomes. To give an example, Midgley had soft bits of metal sprayed into his eye by a blown-out spark plug during his work on airplane fuel additives. He ingeniously devised a solution. When his doctor was unable to remove the pieces, he soaked his eye frequently in pure mercury and floated out the metal pieces. Another example. In order to assuage rumors that his lead gas additive was dangerous, he performed a demonstration for the press. He poured ethyl over his hands, and he held it under his nose for 60 seconds. He failed to report, however, that it took him almost a year to recover from the lead poisoning brought on by this demonstration. One might almost suspect that someone in charge of this universe didn't care much for Tom. We might all be a lot better off if he hadn't existed, or if he had chosen to be a school teacher or janitor instead of a world-class innovator. There's a lesson to be learned from his life, though. And this is the reason I spent some time telling the story. It has to do with not knowing the outcomes of our own actions. That's the promo thing I want I to talk to. So for you to discuss in the comments section. After this, was it really couple. epic bad luck, or was there something wrong with Midgley's devotion to progress and innovation that we can learn from? Was it his fault that his contributions ended up being so harmful? I look forward to your responses. Thanks for watching. So. This is pretty interesting life that at one time it seemed like a perfect invention but there's uh, some problem is kind of rolling along that uh, this guy kind of tried to deny all those consequences of this thing. So that's how kind of a, this is kind of pattern of the, all those environmental problems these days and then back in old days. So we will discuss a lot of this thing over the course. The one more thing, just one more thing. You can just read through this thing by yourself at the very end of the, um, this lecture note that I didn't include it to you. So there will be a 
re reading assignment. Next week, one article called Why Are These Still a Few Women Scientists in the World? So it's about the science, actually physics. So this is, this is kind of a really breathtaking photo taken in the year 1927. It's Solvay Conference in Physics. All the modern physics, the great idea, brilliant idea, are from these people, this number of people. If they are not in the world, we are kind of living in the Newtonian uh, physics world at the time. So this is kind of an iconic photo. How many females in here? Can you find point one? Just one, Marie Curie. But that has not been really changing since then. So this article is talking about why there are few minority in the science. I can see a lot of female students in here. I know you guys are not science major. But I want you to read this thing. I will ask a couple of questions next homework about what you are thinking about this problem. So for example, popular pop culture, Big Bang Theory, how many of you guys watch this thing? Yeah, no more people. How many are physicists in, in here in this photo? Actually three, there are three physicists. This guy, this guy, and this guy. They are all male and then happen to be white or Asian, but this actually kind of a maybe accurate portrait of the current, especially physical science world. So there are two fe female scientists here, but they are all biologists, right? So I will force you to read this article, and then I will ask a couple of questions about the, uh, uh, your opinion. Have a good weekend.